Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Welcome. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Audrey Stewart. On behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am so excited to welcome you to today's event with Peter Godfrey Smith discussing his latest book, Metazoa, Animal Life and the Birth of the Mind. He is joined tonight in conversation by Carl Safina. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community and our new digital community during these challenging times. Every week we're hosting events here on Zoom and as always, our event schedule appears on our website at harvard.com slash events, where you can also sign up for our email newsletter and browse our shelves from home. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for questions. If you have a question at any time during the talk tonight, go to the Q&A button on your screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. If you'd like to purchase a copy of Metazoa, there will be links in the chat where you can purchase. All sales through this link support Harvard Bookstore, so thank you, especially during this difficult time for community spaces like your local bookstore. There will also be a link for donation in the chat if you'd like to give additional support to Harvard Bookstore. Your purchases and financial contributions make this virtual author series possible and now more than ever supports the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Thank you for tuning in. In support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore, we sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings these last few months, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as we can. Thank you in advance for your patience and understanding. Now I am so pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. Peter Godfrey Smith is a professor in the School of History and Philosophy of Science at the University of Sydney. He is the author of six books, including my personal favorite, the best-selling Other Minds, The Octopus, The Sea, and The Deep Origins of Consciousness, which has been published in more than 20 languages. His other books include Theory and, Rel and Reality, An Introduction to Philosophy of Sci Science and Darwinian Populations, and Natural Selection, which won the 2010 Lak Lakotos Award. He is joined tonight by Carl Safina. Carl is the inaugural holder of the Endowed Chair for Nature and Humanity at Stony Brook University. He is the author of multiple books, including Voyage of the Turtle, Becoming Wild, and The View from Lazy Point. His work has received numerous awards and fellowships, including Orion, Lannan, and National Academies Literary Awards. Tonight, they are discussing Metazoa. This new book is an investigation into the evolution and an exploration in perspective. By gaining a greater understanding of the consciousness of the creatures beneath the waves, we grow our understanding of our own consciousness and evolution. I want to leave you with this quote from Library Journal, which calls Metazoa an astonishing range of creatures are an astonishing range of creatures are considered and a fascinating argument in, advanced about how evolutionary innovations can give rise to animal minds. This is popular science writing at its best. And on that note of praise, I'll turn things over to our authors. Peter, Carl, thank you so much for being here tonight. The virtual stage is yours. Thank you. Well, it's our pleasure. And uh, I just wanna say, Peter, congratulations on a tremendously perspective setting book that explores further, further from your last book, Other Minds, which I love, explores the origins of consciousness as it takes us on uh, a bit of a tour of the history of life on earth as well. So since the main arguments that you make are all about consciousness and your considerations of what consciousness is and discussions of other people's thoughts about the matter, what are we talking about? What do you mean by the word consciousness? Because that can mean very different things to different people. So it, it can. And the word itself has become, I think, a little bit of a, 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 a source of difficulty itself. To my mind, it's still the case that the word consciousness suggests not just the bare, the bare presence of experience of some kind, but some kind of sophistication in experience over and above its mere existence. But the way the debate's been going for the last at least 20, maybe 30 years now, the word consciousness has just acquired this broader use where 
um, to use Thomas Nagel's formulation, if there's something it feels like to be you, then you're conscious in a, in a sense. And if there's something it feels like to be a squid, to be a bee, uh, to be anything at all, then that thing is thereby conscious. I think, as I say, I, the, the word makes me a little bit uneasy. It, it, in my own mind, if we could talk primarily about the existence of subjective experience or, or felt experience or just experience, that would in some ways be clearer, but, but the language has taken a particular turn. So when we're talking about consciousness here, um, I think at least initially, the way to focus things is with the idea of there being something it feels like to be you, the presence of feelings of that kind. Now, Christoph Koch, the neurobiologist who you allude to several times in the book, says that consciousness is the thing that feels like something. I, I like that definition. Is, can we go with that? Yeah, yeah. I think of that as, as roughly the same as the Nagel formulation, the thing that feels like something or the feature of life in virtue of which it feels like something to, to be alive and to be going through the world. Yeah. So the, the body, we can just talk about humans for a moment, the, since we know something about the human body, we know that the, the human body does almost everything with no feeling and completely unconsciously. We, we have automatic metabolism, digestion, circulation, immune response, growth, repair, production of gametes, growth of fetuses, and so on. We're not aware of any of those very complex functions. Why do we need consciousness? Why does life need consciousness? Okay. I don't think all life needs consciousness. Um, a question that I think is a real question is, does all life need a kind of uh, what's sometimes called minimal cognition, the ability to sense and respond to events as they occur? It is true that all known cellular life has some ability to sense what's going on and produce a response. To me, that was a surprising fact. Uh, it would have been quite, I think, comprehensible if the situation had been a bit more uh, a bit more in the way that Aristotle imagined, you know, a long time ago, where you have a, a way of being alive that merely involves uh, taking in nutrients, keeping yourself going, then a way of being alive seen in animals, where you sense and respond to things, and then finally, what you what you find in humans. One of the surprises that's emerged over, you know, a long period, but in some ways, especially recently, is that even single-celled life is engaged in sensing and responding. Even single-celled life has what Aristotle would have had to call a sensitive soul uh, in, in a broad sense of that term. Then the question becomes, and we, we're here jumping to a question that I, I battle with in the book, and in the very last chapter, I sort of have an official face-to-face -face with, but I don't think I've really resolved this. If it's true that life in general involves not just the taking in of materials and the use of energy, but a certain kind of informational, tra informational transactions with the environment and responding to events that happens, then does that mean that, the, uh, that some kind of minimal feeling or sentience is also present all the way down? Now, it, it seems an unnecessary thing to say. It seems too strong a thing to say. And part of what I grapple with in the book is the question, what is it about animal life, life where we have a nervous system, where we have senses of the kinds that animals have, what is it about animal life that makes experience a kind of natural consequence of, of the way that we live? And insofar as I have a definite answer, I think some of the peculiarities of nervous systems are really are really important here. Nervous systems are not just control devices, they're very special control devices. So it was quite a long answer to your question, but to try to bring it together, I would say uh, the, the book tries to suggest that although being alive at all involves 
a kind of informational engagement with the environment. Being an animal with the kinds of senses and especially the kinds of actions that we can engage in makes a big difference. And once you have a nervous system in control of all that, then the story is it's natural to expect that things will feel like something, that that will be a natural consequence. So I guess we are, in a way, we're making a distinction between detection and perception, detection being like a motion sensor and sensation. And, and plants probably don't have perceptions of things. Single-celled organisms, you think, don't have perceptions of things. But somewhere, somewhere more complicated than single cells, somewhere in multi-celled animal life, this happens. Why, why do you think that the chemistry of cells and the, the biochemistry of neurons is easy to explain? Well, now that we've, now that many people have done a lot of hard work is easy to explain. And yet um, explaining sensation feels hard to explain. And why are views of material function sort of tight and they feel empirical while views of the mind feel more speculative and are, and are kind of all over the map. Yeah, the, so in, in marking the crucial divide, and in, in a moment I'll say we shouldn't think in terms of a crucial divide, but in, in initially marking out a crucial divide, the idea that perception versus detection is, is the big one is one I'd not go along with, although with a lot of caution. Um, a lot of neuroscientists think that, that genuine perception can occur unconsciously and uh, not merely detection of the sort that a motion sensor and involves or a, a bacterium can engage in. Now, then a lot comes down to what you mean by perception. I mean, some people think that the word perception itself includes an implication that it's being experienced, and that would. I mean, uh, I mean, felt experience. That's what. Oh, I mean. Okay, okay. I mean, what we're talking about. So, right. Okay. Why? Then let me tackle the last part of your question. Why does it seem so? Uh, why does it seem so straightforward, or at least comparatively straightforward, to explain the physical side, and seem so puzzling and anything goes on the mental side? Now that I think is partly due to some quirks of our imaginative capacities. And I do think that part of a solution to the mind body problem in as much as we can see its shape at this time involves getting past certain kinds of illusions that arise naturally given the way that we imagine things. And here I do draw on some ideas from Thomas Nagel who, who we mentioned earlier. There are various kinds of human imagination among them uh, perceptual imagining, when you ima where you imagine seeing something, and sympathetic imagining, where you imagine being something. And roughly speaking, you can only sympathetically imagine uh, something that has a mind, because you're imagining taking the point of view or the perspective of, of that thing. Now, as Nagel said a long time ago, it's just a fact about our minds that we can freely recombine the products of perceptual imagining and sympathetic imagining. So um, I, can, I can look at a, a cup of coffee on my, on my desk and just project into it an imagined point of view where it's sort of sitting there ruminating on what's going on. That's just a, a freely available imaginative uh, exercise we can engage in. And I similarly- A cup of coffee would percolate on what's going on rather than ruminate. Exactly, yes. Um, similarly, you, I, can look at, I can look at my cat and sort of imagine everything sort of dark and silent and no experience there at all. You can do that thing. And what we're trying to do in part with the mind-body problem is get a principled way of marrying up the description of how things work in a biological and sort of quasi-mechanistic way with the imaginative projections that are reasonable to make. Now, the fact that we can make any projection at all at the start of the process, I can imagine no experience in a bird, I can imagine rich experience in a glass of water, 
that means there's a kind of initial untetheredness in the whole process. And I think that this keeps coming back to bite us uh, when we come up with theories in this area. Because one thing we can always do is we can say, you know, here's my story about how the brain works and here's some sense of why experience should be a natural aspect of this. But then it's possible to step back and say, well, I can imagine all that stuff going on and no experience present at all. I can imagine the other side blank. So I don't feel anything's been explained. Now, I don't deny that we can do that imagining, but I think we have to resist the idea that that counts as real evidence for very much. It's just a quirk of how we look at things that, that, that gives rise to this feature. Now, this does make things difficult because then somehow we have to get to a stage where the description of what's present and the imaginative projection have the right kind of relationship where it's justified or reasonable or accurate. And I don't pretend that that's easy, but I think it can look harder than it really is because of this sort of freely available imaginative recombination that we can do. Mm -hmm. You, you talk about different ways that people have thought about the mind. And one of those ways is what you call materialism. That, that's another term I'd like you to define because materialism is a word that has different meanings, some of which are you know, very different and they, they carry baggage about consumerism and that kind of thing. Yeah. But, um, you say that the material mind is more than material. You call it energy and surprises. Um, it, it seems to me that we need a new word for that, but I'd like you to explain where, where you are with that term. People often now use the word physicalism rather than materialism for the view that we're talking about, where I don't think it's too hard to describe the view we're talking about uh, if we set aside the isms for a moment and just say, right, it's the idea that, um, you know, on earth you have a lot of material objects and they engage in various interactions which involve their energetic properties of various kinds. There's a kind of basic inventory of what's present and what goes on in which mentality or experience is not present. You know, chemical reactions, physical interactions, uh, electromagnetic goings on. These are uh, characteristic of non-living things as well as living, of things with minds as well as things without them. Uh, that's the sort of basic physical makeup of what we have around us. And then according to materialism, in my sense, some particular sort of goings on on the part of a small subset of those things uh, is sufficient for experience to exist. It's not that experience is made by it, but some of those things are experience. Certain kinds of physical processes and interactions constitute or are experience. Uh, that's the view. You can also express it by saying, and I think this is a helpful way of um, expressing it as a, as a sort of challenge where different views you know, meet and make different commitments. A materialist thinks that in a sense, you can make a mind from something non-mental. You don't need to start with one. If you start with ordinary physical things and you put them together in the right way and they engage in the right interactions, the result is a mind, it is a thing with experiences. So that, that's the view. The, the word materialism, as you say, is an unfortunate word in various ways. It has that consumerist suggestion to it. And also it suggests just the stuff rather than the activities that the stuff engages in, the energetic or the interactive side. And that's unfortunate. So people sometimes use the word physicalism instead of materialism. I don't much like that word because it points towards, you know, an academic discipline rather than a kind of thing. So physicalism yeah. is said to be the idea that the things that physicists, those people describe are the, fun the fundamental furniture of everything that exists. And that's more or less the same thing as what a materialist might say, but pointing towards the discipline, I think is a bit unhelpful. So we don't really have an ideal word. And okay, we, 
one thing I'm enjoying about this conversation is it's getting into the hardest stuff right from the start rather than starting easy and getting hard. There's a view which is a kind of minority view called neutral monism, uh, which holds that uh, rather than a situation in which the material gives rise to the mental or the, or the mental is a kind of special case of the workings of the material, the words material and mental are words that we have to describe different kinds of manifest manifestations or behaviors of something else which is more fundamental, sort of natural processes in a, in a, in a still broader sense. So what's being denied here is that the material is the sort of fundamental basis. The fundamental basis is something else and the material is one manifestation of, of what's going on there. Um, your, especially your view, so your, your view then, just to try to clarify, is that the mind is a result of physical and energy processes. The mind doesn't somehow come from somewhere and be infused in the brain. It doesn't come from somewhere else and be infused, but neither is it really a result. It's, that makes it sound like a cause effect relationship where you have a brain doing its thing and experience is kind of thrown off as a kind of, as a kind of extra. I think that can't, it's tempting to, to sort of think of it that way initially, but that, that sort of can't be right, I think. Instead, when you have a certain kind of physical process going on that is a mind rather than being a cause of a mind, I think the materialist view has to, has to, have, that, um, has to have that character. I, if, if we have enough time, I may, I may try to wrestle with you on my perception of your own argument uh, about that, because it seems to me that um, you describe the, the brain as creating these, um, these modulations, these rhythmic patterns, these energy fields, and those things are, uh, they're certainly counterintuitive to what most people think of by the word material. And I think that that's where we get stuck a little bit. So it, it, sounds, it sounds thereby that if the brain is creating energy fields, if the, if the brain is um, creating these patterns that, that have rhythm and go back and forth instead of neurons just being one-way conduits. Mm -hmm. um, and the mind exists in those patterns and those energy waves, then it sounds to me like the material creates the mind. And it, and it sounds to me like that's where you end up at the end of the book. So why don't we, well, I guess, why don't we take a few minutes and wrestle with that and then maybe we'll back off into the easier stuff. Sure, right. Okay. One of the things the book does try to do is um, change the kind of gestalt that people have when we think about what kinds of things a brain does and what kind of object a brain is. And the contrast here that matters to me a lot is, is the following. People sometimes think of a brain as a kind of signaling network entirely. You know, you've got a bunch of things, these special cells, they signal to each other. And the big network has to somehow be enough. The activities of the network are supposed to be experience. Is that like where, a computer view of the mind? Like the mind is running a, a computer program? Yeah, a big parallel. And, parallel and, computer. And you, and, you, and you object to that. You don't think that that is, is what's going on at all. I think that there's, I think we should have a different picture of what kind of thing a brain is and what it does, where it is possible to go too far. Um, and some of the ways you were putting it a moment ago made me think, oh, this is going, this is going to one step too far. So the view I want to oppose is the idea that a brain is just a signaling network. And one reason that I think that, well, the main reason I think that's not true is that you have these large scale dynamic patterns, which are a different kind of thing, which involve rhythms and oscillations and electrical fields that are being modulated by the low level workings and by the sensors and 
and by all the rest. Now, it's not the case that we should think, ah, the brain is this physical thing and it kicks off this big sort of blurry wave of energy and that's a mind. I think that would be going too far the other way. And the right view is that a brain is both. It's got this signaling network side to it. You know, those cells are doing that stuff and it's a large part of what's happening. But you also have these large scale or global dynamic and energetic processes as well. And it's that thing as a whole that is sufficient for experience to exist. You know, one shouldn't think of just the signaling network and one shouldn't think of a big blurry field. The brain is an organ that sort of has both sides to it. Now, if it's the case, and as we discussed this, I can definitely see how that might be, that the word material and materialism just inevitably calls up one, one part of this overall picture or one that, side of the That's story. the problem for me, I, because okay. I have to constantly be translating it to myself to say, no, that's not what Peter means when he says it. That is a problem with the word materialism then, yeah. And I, look, I, I, see, I, I see the way the word does that. And in a way, we don't have an ideal language for this. So let's go back a few hundred million years and um, you, you just, um, you, you talk first about the nature of the cell itself, you know, the, the, a, a basic unit of how life works on this planet. And you say that cells are like, uh, cells are not like any other thing, that a cell is a self. What do you, what do you mean by that? That's a very, very intriguing notion. There are, right, there are, there are two things here. One connects naturally to the topic we were just, we were just uh, looking at, which is the, the, the nature of activity in nervous systems. Um, I think as well as people thinking in unhelpful ways about brains and what they do, people often think about life in an unhelpful way because uh, our picture of what's happening in an ordinary cell, not a brain cell, just any old cell, has, has changed in recent years into a view that makes them really much more unusual objects uh, than they had seemed even a few, even sort of 30 or 40 or 50 years ago, where what you should picture inside a cell, again, just any ordinary cell, is not a bunch of little deterministic devices, little microscopic nanoscale robots that, that process chemicals and make things happen, but something more like a kind of a, a storm of activity with a, a large role for randomness, a lot of spontaneous behavior, and all the things that a cell has to do emerge as uh, large scale patterns in the kind of molecular storm that exists in a cell. So a, a, a cell is a different kind of physical object from the physical objects that we're used to having around us, the sort of relatively inert middle sized things. Now, to get to the immediate question, one of the things that a cell has to do is maintain this, this sort of otherwise very unlikely pattern of interaction. And it does so by managing its boundaries, managing its borders, sort of marking itself off from the rest of the environment, allowing traffic between itself and the rest, but controlled traffic. So a cell has a kind of integrity as a self-like unit, you know, as a more or less automatic consequence of what it has to do to stay alive. And the word self has this kind of mentalistic feel to it. And I don't think of that as an unwelcome uh, association here. I think that in trying to understand what an animal is, an animal as a whole, not just the sort of nervous system, but the sort of animal way of being. An animal is a special kind of living thing. And some of these self-involving features of life itself are also present in animal life, just in a, in a, in a sort of larger, more elaborate, you know, evolutionarily highly developed form. In, in your last book, you said something that really stopped me and made me um really think in, in your book, Other Minds, you said that a bacteria 
bacterium with, with no nervous system and only one cell can sense a gradient of nutrients so that it knows whether it's moving toward or against the gradient because it, it, has, it has the ability to understand in some way or to detect, at least detect and analyze in some way, whether the uh, density of the nutrient is, is greater or lesser than it was a moment ago. So it has a detection ability, uh, an analysis ability and a clock of some kind. How, how in the world does all of that happen in a cell and what is the relationship to that kind of capacity to minds, eventual minds. Right, the ability that bacteria have that you were just describing, that's a paradigm case of the phenomenon we talked about at the, at the start of this conversation, one of the early themes, which was the idea that, you know, it's not the case that much of life just kind of eats and stays alive and it's animals that sense and respond to what they sense. It's not like that. All known cellular life has some ability to sense and respond to what's going on. There's a kind of sensitive soul, again, to use the old Aristotelian term, all the way through life, basically. Now, that ability to sort of detect a gradient and move up or down a gradient is a, is a paradigm case of that. And that's really what I have in mind when I talk about the ability to sense and respond as being ubiquitous in life. Um, I, if I tried to sort of go through exactly how they do it, I think we'd be sitting here long after uh, uh, we should be. So I, I won't attempt to do that. Um, the relationship between that and animal life is, I, as I see it, roughly like this. You have individual cells, not just bacteria, but protists, you know, things like paramecia, that can have quite sophisticated abilities to sense and respond. In evolution, it's often quite a good idea to get big. Uh, and even before multicellular life evolved, there was predation and being big was helpful in avoiding that. One feature of the animal part of the tree of life or you know, the thing that got us heading down a certain road was joining together in these enormous colonies of cells forming multicellular life. When you do that, you have to kind of reinvent sensing and action at the new spatial scale where you've got little cells that can sense and act, but they do so, you know, individually. And to get behavior on the scale of an animal, something as enormous as, as a, you know, a, a human being or, or other animal, there's a kind of feat of coordination and integration that has to be achieved. And once you do that, you get back sensing at the new scale. You have multicellular sensors and multicellular um, effectors, devices for action. Again, jumping back to that early but deep theme that we talked about uh, some minutes ago, the story of the origin ex of experience, I think, has to lie in the special features of the way that animals reinvent sensing and action uh, and the nervous systems, again, that, that we use to make this possible. Um, just sticking with bacteria for a moment, you mentioned that bacteria evolved transistors. How does that, um, well, can just explain that for a moment and then how does that fit with what the rest of life did with transistors once they were invented. Sure, right. A, 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 a transistor is basically a, a, a device by which you control electric current with electric current. You use current to control current. So it's, a, it's an electrical switching and control device. One of the puzzles in the history of life that I think, so far as I know, has still not been resolved concerns the fact that whereas you know human built transistors are, you know, were an amazing invention mid 20th century transformative technology the basic thing being done which is controlling a flow of electric current by means of another current had been invented by bacteria uh, billions of years earlier and it's not clear why 
uh, they weren't clearly using them as control devices. They may have been in at least some cases, but they may have, but bacteria back way back then, single cell life way back then, invented a range of ways to achieve what can be called the taming of charge, the taming of electrical charge, turning electrical activity into something that cells can, can put to use. And part of the taming of charge was learning how to control the flows of current across the membranes of cells. And the transistor-like invention, the volt voltage-gated ion channel, is part of that apparatus of charge controlling stuff. Now, when you invent an animal much later, nervous systems are able to put that technology to use. And there they do squarely, they do clearly engage in activities of control. So I'm not quite sure how to even think about this fact that there was a kind of inadvertent perhaps invention of a supremely useful control device well before it had any kind of natural utility of the sort that it would have uh, much later in human technologies, but, but somewhat later in, in animal nervous systems. Yeah, that's really, that's really um, amazing. Uh, I want to um, remind everybody who's listening to please put your questions in the Q&A. We're going to be getting to the questions in a few minutes. I have, um, I have uh, gone through about one third of my questions and almost all of our time. So I think that I should ask you, Peter, what you would like us to know and what, what do you think are some of the main take homes that you're trying to get us to understand with this book and with your explorations? One of the take homes is that I think there's a lot more sentience, a lot more uh, basic consciousness or felt experience in the animal kingdom than we had supposed. So in this chat, um, because you, I'm learning always go towards the sort of fundamental philosophical things uh, I think you're very much a philosopher in spite of your occasional protestations on this point. Well, um, I share that with you. You you described a certain pathology in the profession, which made me feel somewhat vindicated. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, so we, we've done that side, but but a good deal of the book is about the different kinds of lives that different animals live, crustaceans octopuses and other mollusks, uh, fish, which figure fairly centrally. Um, and one of the messages I want to get across is the idea that I think there's good reason to believe that there's a lot more experience around than we had supposed. Interestingly, including some of the most uh, intriguing uh, kinds of experience which are sort of roughly speaking offline experiences such as dreams and mind wandering and daydreams things like that well i think I, go ahead we're finish. learning a lot about the widespread the potentially very widespread character of that so that's one message and the other message is that i think the book the book doesn't claim the mind body problem is solved it doesn't sort of with a stroke of a pen try to kind of just tie everything off but i think if we um, think hard about the peculiarities of living systems and beyond that the peculiarities of what nervous systems do and the ways they control the, um, the modes of action and sensing and dealing with the world that animals can engage in. I think it's not surprising that a, a, a physical world, a biological world contains experience. I think the problem becomes at least a lot more a lot less baffling than it was before. So you, you talk a lot about octopuses, which you have wonderful experiences with, and you relay really, really wonderfully some of the most enjoyable parts of your, your book, this book and your last book are your observations of octopuses who seem to have evolved their minds completely independently of ours because they're not on the same evolutionary branch. Either that 
or some something like a mind was present in our last ancestor, which was something like a flatworm about 700 million years ago. Um, but crustaceans seem to have evolved minds independently uh, or the same applies, it, or a mind happened very, very, very early. And, um, and then maybe vertebrates. So is a mind an inevitability of a biological system that attains some level of complexity, do you think? Not an inevitability, I think. I mean, that, that's in some ways a question about, it, it's a hard question to answer because we'd have to think about all the ways in which you might get very complicated and do things very differently from the ways that we do them and then ask the question, is that difference enough to sort of take us out of the realm of having a mind? Well, what's now, octopuses your, what's, what, are important what, because they are very different, but I think there's good evidence that they do have experiences. So, so well, well, I'm so, certainly convinced that they, that they do. You'd have to deny everything about the evidence of their behavior to think that they don't. But do you, do you, do you think that consciousness is likely to have arisen once or um, multiple times. Ah, right. The, the contrast that you made a second ago, I think is that's the right way to make, to pose the question. And I'm not quite sure how to go further down the path of answering that question where one scenario has it that you've got, you've got roughly speaking three groups in the animal kingdom where you have very complex behavior and very sophisticated nervous systems, vertebrates, um, arthropods, which include insects and crustaceans, and some mollusks, cephalopods notably. So, and their common ancestor, as you say, lived a very long time ago, 600 or so million years ago. So one scenario is you have something back then which didn't have experiences at all, and you have three separate inventions, or perhaps more than three, but, but some number in the vicinity of, of, of three. That's sort of option A for me. And the other option is, that we're thinking about this in the wrong way and um, we need to be more thoroughgoingly gradualist about it, where there's not a kind of invention of experience on several branches, but you have something present in the common ancestor or even before, which is, right, it's not experience, but in evolution, you're always dealing with sort of halfway partial gray area cases and our language is letting us down if we insist on asking, you know, was that thing experienced and did it evolve once? It was something which was sufficient to then ramify and develop into experience in those three cases and, and perhaps more, but don't describe it in terms of a yes, no, you know, we shouldn't describe it in terms of that yes, no distinction. Right, right. Now, th those two scenarios that, that we'll call that scenario B, those two scenarios A and B, I think of as the kind of, the live scenarios, the important ones. And I'm not able to come down firmly one way or the other. Uh huh. I would sort of go for A, that's, basically. Well, that's interesting. Um, final question, because we only have about a minute before I want to switch over to the Q and A's. But um, people ask me whether I think insects are aware and conscious. And I, my usual answer is, I don't know. They certainly seem like they are, but it's hard for me to imagine and understand what's going on with a creature that's so different. But you described um, a number of things about the, the moods of insects, the learning ability of insects. And I thought most intriguingly, an experiment where they were trying to see if, if they could make a bee feel pain by putting a clamp on its leg and see if they went to uh, ease that pain by using morphine. They, they didn't go for the drug, but they tried with their other legs to remove the clamp, which seems like a very goal-directed thing. So what do you think is sort of the simplest life form that has what you describe in insects, um, apparent moods, abilities to learn, and um, what looks like felt experience. 
if that's we that's right. our final final question. Once some... you once you ask the question that way, then I think it does become important to say, you know, we shouldn't be using a yes or no category here. We should be attentive to the gradient or scaled nature of this, where there's more and less experience-like things. But you asked the question in a fairly concrete way, you know, which of the simplest animals in which we find uh, mood-like states and uh, gastropods, slugs and snails would be uh, a good answer there. They have quite simple nervous systems and for a long while they've been, con been considered just completely out of the realm of possible experiencing beings, but the same kinds, some, some of the same kinds of mood-like or emotion-like states uh, are seen in those. And that I think is a good example of unexpected complexity on the kind of quasi experiential side that we see in, uh, in certain animals. So I, I, I'm going to add one further question to try to clarify um, what I think is one of your most important points, which is that um, consciousness and felt experience is not an on off switch that probably has some, you know, minimal component in some early cases and then becomes more elaborated, sh sharper, more awareness. My, my analogy, you do a lot of scuba diving. My analogy is a lot like being underwater here in the Northeast US where there's almost no visibility. And, you know, I can see, but not very well. I'm aware of light patterns. I can't hear very acutely. I'm just aware of noises around me. And I kind of imagined some um, early thing having s s dim sensations of a world around it that were beneficial to it in its ability to evaluate whether it was in a good place or, or near something that it needed like food or, or shelter or something like that, but that this is all like everything in life is on a continuum. Nothing in life to me is in real categories. Is that one of the points you're trying to make here about consciousness? Yeah, I, I, and I think that's a good, I think that's a good way of thinking about it, both in the kind of the, the graded or gradient nature and, and the, the setting in the image, the idea, the, the fact that we are dealing with a marine context for all the early stages all this stuff evolved in the sea initially. And the kind of problem faced, the sort of dim water, the washes of light, stuff being carried towards you in a way, I think that's quite, a, quite an appropriate way of thinking of, of, of setting the scene for the early stages. I'm gonna to go to the questions now, which I'm looking at here. Um, one of the things um, that I, I think probably a lot of people are wondering is what are the ethical implications if, uh, if a cuttlefish dreams, which you say that, you know, experiments show that they dream, they have the same kind of patterns and they twitch and they change color. Wh what does this mean for the way we treat the rest of the living world? Right. I think the first thing it means is that we should extend basic consideration much more broadly than we have. Take into account the fact that there's a lot more experience, including evaluative experience like pleasure and pain or pleasure like and pain like states. There's a lot more of that around than, than people had thought. Now, one way of responding to that is to, is to sort of use a notion of rights and say we're going to extend rights far more broadly than we had before. I don't favor a rights-based moral framework in general. I think of rights as political constructs uh, that have their most natural home within human political life or human social life. And I think the, to sort of just sort of extend in a blanket way rights to everything sentient, for example, is itself in a way not to take seriously the gradient nature of what we're talking about here. So I think we need new language and new ways of thinking about this. What we need to do, I think, is accept that there's a lot more experience around us than we had supposed. Animal life is sort of experientially richer as a whole. We should rethink our relationships to that life. And I think some of the rethinking is pretty straightforward. I think that, you know, factory farming 
is it's very easy to get to the conclusion that we should stop doing that. Beyond that, it gets hard because you're dealing with probably very minimal forms of uh, experience in some cases. Animal life itself is this unending carnage of eating and being eaten. And the question we should be asking is, you know, what kind of relationship do we as humans want to have with that kind of process? Yeah, I actually think that's a, a, a wonderful way of putting it. What kind of relationship do we want to have? What about plant consciousness? Plants do a lot of things. Leaves move as the sun tracks across the sky. What, if anything, are plants doing and sensing? They're doing a lot of signaling. Are they doing any sensing? Plenty of sensing and lots of signaling and um, some forms of sensing and signaling that look surprisingly like what animals do with their nervous systems. They do this without having a nervous system. And you know, as, as the book goes on and as I thought through this, I came to believe more and more in the importance of nervous systems as a really unique evolutionary invention. So I think of plants as probably uh, not having experiences. I, I'm basically against plant consciousness, which is an interesting current discussion. Um, one reason I think it's so, it's, it's such a, it, it's such a tempting idea is the gestalt switch is so sort of vivid and surprising. I mean, we go, we can go from thinking of plants as merely these inert nutritive things to suddenly seeing them as agents and as sensing and responding and so on. And it's true that they are sensing and responding to what they sense, but just as I think applies in the case of bacteria, you can do that without having the kind of apparatus that I think makes for experience in us, a nervous system. So I have come to look at plants a little differently as a consequence of these discussions, but I'm not making the move to thinking, them, thinking of them as experiencing beings. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about biopsychism? Yeah, I mean, it, well, this takes us, this is a continuation very much of the theme we were just talking about. So the term biopsychism, as far as I know, was coined by Ernst Haeckel uh, back around 1900. Uh, Haeckel, who also um, coined lots of the terms that sort of populate this discussion, I think in, including Metazoa itself. And Haeckel introduced this as a term for the idea that it's intrinsic to all life to have experience. All life has a mind. To be alive is to have a mind. And this is different from panpsychism, which is the idea that everything, alive or not, has a kind of mental side to it. Um, Haeckel was interested in a kind of series of more and less restricted views where it's animals, it's all living things, it's absolutely everything. If you think that what plants do and what bacteria do, the sensing and responding, the, the, the processing involving simple forms of memory that you mentioned earlier in, in our conversation, if you think of all that as genuinely mental, and especially if you think of that as experiential, as involving experience, then you're probably a biopsychist. Unless you're a panpsychist where you think that even grains of sand and tables have this as well. Hegel himself, to my surprise, having marked out this fairly extreme, but, but not as extreme a view as panpsychism, which he called biopsychism, he then said, and I'm a panpsychist. You know, he, he went to the even more inclusive or in, in my mind, extreme view in which you think that uh, all, all matter, everything, uh, has a kind of mental, a mental component to it. And he argued for this in terms of the kind of selective ways in which chemicals respond to each other. The, the, he thought even that's a kind of mental, shows a kind of mentality. And that I think is clearly going too far. I think biopsychism is also going too far, but it's not as, not as easy I think a question is, it can initially appear. So kind of along those lines, uh, 
Bill says the firing of neurons, the patterns, even large scale patterns of neural firing and the electrical fields due to these patterns of firing are all physical processes. How do we make the jump if we need to make one to perception or I'll add sensation? It's not, so what a brain does, I think, so there are roughly two pieces to the story I try to put together in the book. There's the part that involves the peculiarities of nervous systems, which we've been talking about quite a lot here. There's also the part that involves the evolution of perception and action as animal capacities. Uh, the different kinds of bodies that arise, the ways in which those bodies enable animals to act and manipulate, the advent of sensing that involves a, a sort of tacit distinction between self and other. You know, when you, when you act, you have a continual sense of what you expect to see or hear as a consequence of your actions and you refer other events to the externally caused. So the distinction between self-caused and other caused sensory events, that's very common in, in the animal kingdom. It's not, certainly not a sort of human peculiarity Part of the story in sort of bridging the gap, the, the, the sort of physical and experiential gap here is, is talking about the way in which an animal becomes a certain kind of nexus or locus of sensing and acting with a, with a tacit sense of self in many cases, uh, with a kind of point of view on the world in a, in a relatively strong sense of that term point of view. There's that side and there's the side that involves the peculiarities of the control system that makes all this possible, including the global dynamic features of, of uh, brains. You put the two together, I argue, and it's not such a leap to think that experience is there. Now, I can't in a few minutes do all the knitting together that I think can be done. And I don't think that the story told is complete but it's those two ingredients together. It's the kind of, you know, the animal as a locus of sensing and acting and the nervous system as a unique control system that makes this possible. It's, it's both those things together that, that tell the story. Um, I think I have time for maybe one or two quick questions. I'd say one more. Okay. All right, we'll, we'll make this the, uh, uh, an easy, fun one. Have you seen the documentary My Octopus Teacher? And what did you think of it? I have seen it. I, I, I thought it was absolutely charming and, and, and very good. Uh, uh, I, I do recommend it to, 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 to those who, who haven't seen it, though. I think probably many people watching this have seen it. Uh, I'm in awe of his ability to uh, free dive without a wetsuit in that water. Uh, I cannot imagine that he deserves all the accolades for that alone. And the octopus is, was a delightful animal and his interactions with it were also delightful. So yes, I'm quite a fan. Yes, I saw it twice and I, I really enjoyed it. Actually, I liked it better the second time after I read an article about how it was made. Um, oh, I'd like to read that, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, very, very very interesting about how they put a lot of it together and all their editing decisions, which I think any author who has struggled with how to place different things and how to construct a book can very much relate to a, a very difficult film to put together out of many hundreds of hours of, uh, of right. work. I, I want to say that I think in closing, you, I think you did a fantastic job of putting this book together for all of these topics that are so difficult to wrestle through, the book is not at all difficult to wrestle through. The book is a very smooth ride, very stimulating, and, um, and with some really nice stories and anecdotes about your own experiences. I recommend it really highly, as, as I do Other Minds, your last book. Okay, so I guess, I guess we're done. Our hour is up. Our hour is up, but um, yes, it's a beautiful book. If you haven't already, check out the link in the chat to purchase Metazoa. Um, Peter, Carl, thank you so much again for joining us tonight and having this really fantastic conversation. This was a lot of fun. 
Um, thank you everyone at home for tuning in and showing up for authors, publishers, indie book selling, and our incredible staff here at Harvard Bookstore. If we didn't get to your questions, I'm sorry. We only had an hour, but thank you again for coming. Um, from all of us at Harvard Bookstore, be well. Have a great night. Thanks, and thanks, Kyle. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Audrey. Good night, everybody. Take Good night. care.